Well, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, your moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a really, really interesting webinar today, guys. I'm really excited about this one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items that we need to go over. Uh, first of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the discussion, please know that you'll be able to access the webinar on demand. You'll be receiving an email sometime post-event that will uh, include a link to get you to the webinar on demand. And we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during the presentation you have a question for any or all of our panelists, just feel free to use your control panel, go to webinar control panel, submit your question, and we'll probably take about 15 minutes or so near the end of the presentation to go over those audience questions. Okay, without further ado, let's talk about today's webinar, DevOps Driven Business Transformation, a panel discussion. We have three really great speakers today. We have Tim Buntell, who's DevOps Advocate at Zebia Labs, Jonathan Parnell, DevOps Evangelist, and Brian Dawson, DevOps Evangelist at CloudBees. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it, and I'm really excited about this. Thank you, Charlie. I'm excited as well. Great, great. So <laughs> I think probably the first thing to do is if we, if I could ask each of you to just um, give a kind of 30 second overview of uh, who, who you are and uh, what you really enjoy most about the DevOps world. Tim, why don't you get started? Yeah, great. Thanks, Charlene. And um, Jonathan, uh, Brian, it's great to be here with you and all of you listening today. So I'm Tim Buntell. I'm uh, part of the team at Zebia Labs. I've been on the product side for, for many years uh, in building dev, uh, dev tools and uh, uh, software that uh, engineering teams use. So for me, the most exciting thing about this is really seeing the way that we're finally having uh, conversations about culture and organizational practices coming together with technology. So it's no longer just about tools, uh, it's really about people and the transformations and the organization. So I love seeing those two uh, pieces uh, intermix. Great, thanks. Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you are enjoying most about the DevOps? Jonathan Parnell, um, spent the majority of my career um, software engineering cloud kind of big data and then running a lot of agile and DevOps teams. Um, my focus currently for the past few years has been uh, primarily helping uh, enterprises uh, go through their DevOps transformations, working uh, on C levels and the VPs on structuring, structuring those roadmaps and what that looks like. Um, the thing I enjoy the most really is the reinvestment into the people. Uh, when people now realize that um, they, with some additional skills, some reorg reorganization and um, the promises that you know, Agile makes and DevOps delivering, you see that they can now see um, the value that they're able to provide now for the next level of their careers. And uh, I think at a personal level, that's probably the most enjoyable for me. Okay, great. Brian, tell us about yourself, please, and what you enjoy most. So I'm Brian Dawson. Uh, as the slide says, I'm currently um, a DevOps evangelist at, uh, at CloudBees. And um, as I may share throughout the call, one of the interesting changes going on right now is that I am working um, with some of the powerful minds within CloudBees to help focus uh, a DevOps improvement initiative internally, right? So not only do we help people implement DevOps, we are continually looking to refine what we do. Uh, my history um, spans back, I, you know, I don't know, 20 more years than I'd like to note in software mm -hmm. development. I've had the privilege of working um, in in the majority of the facets involved in software development from QA to, to engineering, to development management, um, to, uh, to, to internally facilitating transformation, and then ultimately to um, leading a enterprise agile transformation practice. Um, what what excites me most about DevOps, Tim and, and Jonathan took my answer. They must have looked at my cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, it's the it's the culture, right? And I think that um, yes, I am passionate about the tools, the technology, the process and practices that are required for successful implement implementation of DevOps. But I think the real powerful um, um, effort and then ultimately impact of DevOps is the transformation of the culture. Excellent. Excellent. All right. 
Well, it sounds like we've got the basis for a great conversation today then. Speaking of conversations, today's uh, conversation is being uh, in, it's based in part on the latest ebook from DevOps.com, DevOps Driven Digital Transformation. So that's going to be uh, available via a download on DevOps.com and, and also uh, in part of your, uh, in your post event email, you'll be receiving a link to download this, this, uh, this ebook. So, yay. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right on in DevOps and business transformation. So, you know, let's let's take a step back and see exactly what that means. I mean, you know, organizations have been steeped in DevOps, uh, their transformation, the DevOps transformation for years, but you know, a, a lot of folks have seen, uh, you know, their their businesses transform, and and you know, I kind of wonder if if that is, um, you know, if it's kind of a chicken and egg type thing, but you know, really, the the, the premise of the ebook is that the fact that DevOps transformations have been going on for years, and so, you know, a lot of companies have seen uh, their their organizations change on a number of different levels. So, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, breaking it down, really, as I, as I just said, it's kind of a chicken and egg question for me. Um, but I want to I want to know what you guys think about it. I mean, are we are we looking at um, you know, DevOps? Has DevOps forced business transformation, or is that desire for business transformation forcing DevOps? I mean, you know, which which is it? What do you guys think? Um, go ahead, Brian. Oh, this, 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 sorry, this is Jonathan. Um, yeah, in answer to that, you know, when when you look at what um, I feel is trying to be solved when you look at digital transformation in itself, um, we're really talking about the first person to reach a user, understand a user, and react to the user is really, at the end of the day, what digital transformation is trying to deliver on. And um, in the ebook was great how EA described the level of complexity of that disparate teams and things that contribute to that user experience. And I feel that um, in order to move faster, DevOps and these things started being understood of the practical and pragmatic way to get there. So from at least what I've seen, it's generally that uh, realization trying to uh, get to the end user that's been driving the need and also creating the value stream map to map into the investment that it requires. Yeah, I'd, I'd say for me, you know, at the highest level, it's it's less about the DevOps transformation. It's about the the sort of digital transformation, right? About how all of the great companies today are really software companies, right? So no matter what you make, even if you don't, you, you may not sell something called software, but to successfully, you know, build and market and deliver your product and interact with your customers and get value uh, to your customers, you're going to rely on software no matter what kind of organization you have. So finding the ways to do that uh, as efficiently and quickly as possible is going to let you beat the competition regardless of your market. Right. So for me, that's really what it's about. It's about um, the, the leveraging that technology in the way that's going to benefit your company. And this kind of chicken and the egg thing, um, I was reading a Medium post uh, earlier today, a guy named Paul Ingalls had written, basically, it was writing about Kubernetes, and he said, you know, we didn't change our organization because we wanted to use Kubernetes, we used Kubernetes because we wanted to, use, to change our organization, right? So, you know, I think that's where all of these issues come together. It's, it's about that transformation and digital, uh, and DevOps is, in many ways, the, the means to accomplish that. Yeah, and I, I, I'd add, yeah, it, it's a good way to uh, sort of characterize a chicken or egg question, because um, there's, a, you know, uh, there, there, there isn't necessarily an ultra clear answer. There are a number of ways to attack it. I would say that a lot depends on, so a, a DevOps transformation or DevOps improvement can start without a business uh, transformation initiative. Um, however, ultimately, um, the two have to interplay to, to, together. They have to work together. They fuel each other. Um, so, you know, you may recognize that there is a need to, as, as uh, JP or Jonathan said, which I may um, state wrong, right? It's digital transformation is about reaching, um, re reacting to, I'm sorry, reaching, reading, and reacting to the customer um, first. 
And you may recognize that an optimized software development process is going to be our pathway to achieving that. And then decide that a DevOps initiative is what you should pursue to achieve that end state. But what we also see oftenly, often, I'm sorry, frequently, is that a DevOps transformation um, starts or the innovation that the want for innovation is being seeded at a ground level or a grassroots level with, within forward-thinking development teams or operations teams that just want to make their life better. Now, those guys usually can facilitate or affect that improvement locally, but that improvement won't achieve the state where it transforms the business until the business is involved in supporting um, that transformation. So is it safe to say then that in that case, DevOps should be that catalyst for DevOps, for business transformation? I would beg with, with you know without adding some of the nuance and color to it I would beg to say yes. Okay, is there is there ever uh, a, a scenario then and anybody can answer this where you think uh, business transformation should be the the catalyst for devops, you know, is it is is it you know are, are we looking at two distinct scenarios that both hold equal weight? Yeah, again, for me, you know, DevOps is is really a way to find those efficiencies for what you already have decided that you want to do, right? You have decided as an organization to, you know, leverage technology to build and deliver value to your customers. And DevOps, by combining, you know, Dev and Ops, going to the original kind of portmanteau of the, of the word, is bringing those things together. But you're really doing that to remove the barriers from getting that value to your customers, right? So if you haven't decided that you believe that the value uh, that you can bring to your customers and that your business can reveal through uh, the, the digital uh, services that you create and offer, uh, you really need to start there as far as I'm concerned. And, yeah, and-, and um, Oh, sorry, Johnny, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Brian. And, and Brian actually mentioned a good point. So we, um, we had actually an interesting uh, case study with um, one of the DevOps transformations that we were leading, and we had a grassroots kind of a movement with the QA team that had, you know, a very, um, actually pretty sophisticated test automation framework, but um, none of that was being essentially shared across the organization. And um, we were trying to find a pilot within that enterprise account to fund what they had wanted to do to try to scale this. And uh, what they had discovered was a marketing team that needed a mobile application and simply got that marketing team to invest into that DevOps transformation. So um, going back to the chicken and egg problem, that is one way that we've seen it be successful when with the grassroots finding a customer within the organization that had a need to reach their end users quicker. And that's I, to play off of what you said, Jonathan, um, if I may squeeze in, Charlene, is, mm -hmm. is to a certain extent, I'd say that the business transformation is, is, is to, a, to a certain extent, the North Star of a DevOps transformation, right? A DevOps transformation without an end objective, right? If, if, you, if you as an organization, which we do see happening, just come in and say, I want to be DevOps, um, and you don't have a clear idea of the outcome that you are trying to achieve uh, and the, the benefit, um, then, then, then you, are, you are without direction, right? And if you are without direction, you don't have a problem to solve to prove that you are taking the right approach, um, most likely um, um, that will fail. So while the transformation in some cases may not, the business transformation um, may not be the catalyst for driving DevOps. Um, it absolutely has to be the guiding star. Okay, so so more than just a, a company has to have more than just a goal. They actually have to have an objective in mind as well. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, so when we're talking about business transformation, we're talking about DevOps. We're talking about users and we're talking about customers. So, you know, obviously the, the benefits of DevOps and business transformation are, are, are pretty obvious to the company. You know, it's, 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 you're, you're doing better, you're doing better work faster with, with, uh, you know, happier customers in the end, I think. But, you know, really who, 
who does benefit more when, when you've got that successful uh, DevOps business transformation kind of mojo happening through the company? You know, is it the company who benefits more or is it the customers who benefit more? And, and you know, is, is, is it kind of an equal or what do you guys think? Yeah, so, you know, I see one of the, uh, the metrics that we, that we see a lot with you know these high-performing DevOps organizations, I did a uh, webinar with uh, Nicole Forsgren from Dora a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that high-performing DevOps organizations uh, do is uh, a much much faster mean time to recover. Right. So to me, the meaning behind that statistic is creative innovation. Right. So if you know that you can. Uh, be innovative and take risks and try to deliver value to your customers. And no matter how it, you know, if there's a problem with it, you can easily recover. It, it unleashes this sort of creativity from your development organization that ultimately benefits the customers. Because if you are in your organization and you can be innovative and you can try new things and you can experiment with ways to get value to your customers, ultimately the customer are the beneficiaries of that and you have this really tight feedback loop through DevOps that allows the customers to give that feedback to the development organization which in turn uh, continues to unleash that that creativity and that uh, innovation so I think it's it's really a, a virtuous cycle between both the customers and the company yeah okay Great. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Then we've got uh, the, you know, let's let's take a look at some of the parallels between DevOps and business transformation. Uh, uh, you know, some some might argue that business transformation uh, with in certain companies have uh, have happened actually without uh, any DevOps in place. Um, but uh, I I I would I would venture a guess and say that uh, those are kind of few and far between because every Every business transformation uh, initiative has to include some, at least, some sort of element of DevOps. But you know, if you think about it, it it does make sense that DevOps and business transformations are kind of symbiotic. Um, you know, there are certain important, I, I believe, important parallels between the two. And you know, obviously, I've got technologies, methodologies, and culture here. Now, noticing that culture is the third one listed, but I don't think it's the least important one. So I am really interested in what you guys have to think of, have to say about what I've listed here and whether I've missed anything or whether I've missed the mark altogether. What... Go starting now. <laughs> Whoever wants. I, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump okay. in. Um, you know, I think there's. I, I I wouldn't say that you've missed anything. I'd say there's different words to use. We use to describe this. You know, oftentimes people talk about you know the magic three people. Pro, you know, uh, right. I'm sorry, uh, people, process, and tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to talk about um, people and culture because you need to influence people through you know through through influ influence and motivate people through the change of culture process and practices which i see you know being two different things one is what you know how do we actually define that we want to work and then how do people work which mm -hmm. supports and is supported by culture and then ultimately under the on the technology line i would add um tools um mm -hmm. it is the combination of tools and technology um that allow us to to optimize and hopefully ultimately achieve velocity through codification of our process, practices, people, and culture. Um, um, a kind of an aside statement is I like that you called out that culture is by far um, not the least um, important thing. I'd say that sort of all of these planes how, or, 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 or areas, however we characterize them, are equally critical. One mm -hmm. cannot exist without the other. Um, and know, each like, impacts the other. And each impacts and each impacts the other. Um, I'd say that 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 culture going back to what we said earlier, it is um, both. I, I think what people feel the most. Right. It's where at the end of the day, where where um, as an organization, as a business, you feel the most um, the most impact. Um, uh, but it is also the soft science. It is also um, the thing that there is not a clear play playbook for changing. It is where you see the most um, 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 difference and deviation 
between different organizations. So it's very hard for us to just you know, establish reusable patterns to influence culture. Um, but yes, I, I'd say I'd say you've you've you know in different words than some other people, you've covered the areas that need to be influenced, um, and uh, and 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 just want to emphasize that they are all equally important. Okay. Yeah, I'd I'd add, Charlene, that you know it, it's really about delivering software with both speed and stability, right? And all three of these things are required to do that. Uh, you need technology that can help automate the processes that will uh, lead to automation and continuous delivery in these methodologies. But culture fundamentally can, can stymie all of that. You can have great products and good processes behind it, but if you don't have organization, uh, organizational alignment with cross-functional teams working efficiently together, then all of that automation and those tools aren't going to do anything. Uh, I often say you can't tool your way into DevOps. Uh, you yes. need to have the, the teams aligned. And, and so culture really is the, the thing ultimately that can break the value delivery from all of these, these other, you know, the technologies and the methodologies and the approaches. You know, it's interesting yeah. because um, I've been, you know, covering this space for a couple of years now. And when I first started, every conversation was about, the processes. And then last year, it seemed to be all the conversations were about the tools. This year, all the conversations seem to be about the people. So it's it's interesting to me to kind of see where the conversations are happening each year and the fact that people are, are recognizing that each of these are equally important, but you know maybe they haven't had as much weight in the conversation until until now, so interesting. Jonathan, I didn't mean to interrupt you, um, but I just wanted to point that out, that uh, people are having these conversations and it seems to be kind of a, a critical mass uh, situation for each of these. Yeah, it, and I think, I think what people are starting to figure out, right? So we use the word culture a lot, right? But um, when you look at the actual definition, right, it consists of basically three core components, uh, thinking, behaving, and working. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you get into CI, you know, how, we, how do we structure work, you know, uh, how do we deliver things, how do we work together. But um, the reason that we, we focus so much on that in the beginning now is uh, when, you, when you break down these silos and you start having people work together that never worked together before, um, it's a myth that everyone's going to like each other from day one or trust each other, right? And so you have to have things and mechanisms within the business to help that culture take shape organically, but still continue to move forward to a given direction. So um, what type of things, you know, do you have for you know, community standpoint or team building? How do you prepare programming? Um, how do you create a high level of trust? Um, all those things are things that, you know, from a holistic standpoint, you have to kind of plan for and put some things within the organization to get that culture actually moving and, and gelling. And I think now that people are starting to understand that once they've made this investment in DevOps, that they're starting to see that now they have to really truly build that culture to get everyone on the same page and working together. Okay. All right, great. Um, looking at the clock and realizing we need to move a little faster here. So let's move on to the next, um, talking about the benefits of uh, DevOps and business transformation. You know, obviously the, the you, for perhaps the most obvious is the quality of the finished product. If, you know, if if DevOps and business transformation have been done correctly, is met, you know, it's you're going to have uh, you're going to have a really high quality product, hopefully. Um, you know, but regardless of of which comes first, at least in in my mind, whether it's business or transformation, you know, I I think the success of one will lower that adoption curve of the other. So, you know, if 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 an employee sees and feels kind of the benefits of business transformation. Um, you know, if, if there's no more repetitive tasks um, that, you know, now they're all automated or they're, they're not seeing any more late nights kind of manually working through code, they're going to be more inclined to embrace the next thing that potentially will make their jobs easier. So, so if, you know, if, if, if DevOps is being adopted in the organization, they're seeing results. You know, business, other things that, that relate to business transformation, I think are going to fall in line uh, with with employees. So um, that's my take. What do you guys, what do you guys think? 
Yeah, one that uh, I'll add here that I think touches on a, a few of the points that you made, Charlene, is um, we are speaking to a lot of um, you know CTOs and, and leaders in organizations, and one of the challenges outside of digital transformation that folks are facing is attracting and retaining talent. It's really hard to, to find and hire great engineers and developers and creative uh, technology folks. And for me, one thing that we hear really consistently is people like working in environments that have been successful in a DevOps uh, transformation more, right? You're able to be more creative, you're able to have more autonomy, uh, there's more independence, and all of those things can really have a significant impact to the bottom line for leaders of technology teams who have to find and retain great talent. So uh, I'd add that as an additional benefit. That's a good point. Brian or Jonathan? Oops, I was talking Sorry. on mute. Excuse me. Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to underscore that, Tim. That's something um, that I am frequently hearing or I have frequently heard when working one on one with clients and customers. Um, and, and I frequently cite, but I think that, you know, Tim, um, you are, are one of too few people that are actually citing that as a motivation, right? Um, if you implement uh, modern development practices, you're able to eliminate waste, enable your, your development process participants to deliver more value to the customer. You tend to do better at, at, at maintaining, and not only maintaining, but gaining top talent, which cyclically affects all of the other benefits. If you have happier, motivated um, participants in the process, um, you're more likely to deliver innovation. You're more likely to be productive. Right, you're more likely to mitigate or or or, or reduce um, the errors that are introduced. Um, I like to cite um, um, data that um, that Intuit had shared, um, where they sought to adopt a global continuous delivery platform, basically consolidate the different bits and pieces of what different teams were doing to sort of standardize um, 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 implementation of this um, uh, uh, platform to achieve velocity. Well, they do a monthly sort of employee satisfaction survey um, for the teams that adopted this continuous delivery platform. I want to say it was within four weeks, they had found um, upwards of a 15% improvement in employee satisfaction. Um, and there's other data points um, I, I can't exactly pull up now, but I will say that there is data supporting the fact that high performing organizations um, result in happier employees. Um, and that's just an important benefit for us to recognize. Yeah, and I'll um, and also take it from maybe a little bit different perspective, but same point. But um, a lot of times when we're when we're getting into um, structuring what the CICD pipelines look like and we look and we start looking at WIP or how we structure work, um, we really try to recommend and structure that there's 20 to 25 percent of time is spent on continuous experimentation. So if they're having to learn new languages for backend, if they're having to learn microservices patterns, um, that we're allowing that current group that's already within the organization and has, has been there for some time, we're teaching the company to reinvest into them. Um, because even though, you know, even if you can find other resources to bring in, it still takes time and you still want to um, make sure that you're addressing the, the people that have been there for, for quite some time. So we've seen that's pretty successful. You know, it's definitely one of the models that Google implements. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it works well, but just something to think about. So Jonathan, when, when you're talking about that, um, are, you, are you advocating that companies rather than go out and look for new uh, new employees to take on new tasks you're you're advocating offering the current employees the the ability to take on those tasks uh, and and then hire uh, people to take over their their old tasks or or is it just a, a, a mixture of the two or yeah it's, it should be a combination of both uh, that that we generally recommend so. yeah okay cool that's an interesting point. Great. Okay, moving and Charlie, on. Let's, yeah. Because that last last point on benefit too. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about a lot of uh, kind of personal things, but don't forget there's real impact to the bottom line too, right? I mentioned the Dora survey, 
and they found again over over three years the highest performing DevOps teams, uh, the companies that had the high performing DevOps teams had 50% higher market cap growth over that three year period too, right? So uh, all of these things can really impact the company's bottom line. We're not doing it solely because we want to be uh, creative and a uh, happy environment. We're doing it because this is delivering real value that gets reflected in the success of the business in things like market cap growth. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to slow you down, Charlene. I do want to add right. a caveat that I've wanted to add on a couple of sides. It's, it's important to note, and I think we all assume this, that inherently the name DevOps and bringing in DevOps engineers and automating deployment to productions does, does, does not inherently ensure that you're going to recognize these benefits. I think all too mm -hmm. often um, there's a bit of practicing DevOps in name only. Um, um, it is, it, you know, it is influencing all of those tiers we talked about before or just to shorten it due to time. I'd say you have to implement DevOps correctly for your organization and your organization's needs in order to share the benefits. So let's not get trapped into thinking hey, we've implemented DevOps, we're going to recognize all these benefits um, inherently. Right. Well, and that, that's a perfect seg in, into my next slide. But, but you know, you're, you are absolutely correct in saying that, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 there is like no one size fits all of DevOps. It's, it's really got to um, be implemented to, to address your particular company's needs and, and goals and objectives. So our next slide then, Let's talk about the challenges. I mean, obviously, it's not all wine and roses. There are some challenges to transformation. You know, first of all, people, I mean, you know, what must be accomplished for success? So, you know, we've got to overcome executive and technology team leadership barriers, um, the objections that come from all levels. Um, you've got to uh, have these team building exercises. You know, the bottom line is everybody's got to be feel like they are a part of and they are vested in the process and then I, you know go yeah. ahead oh i'm sorry if we're gonna okay I, mean, I, I this this is a big one for me as you could probably tell with the comments <laughs> on, on cultures and i i um i say two words you need you need you need trust and you need empathy and mm -hmm. i like to say that you need to organizationally right through organizational um restructuring and through new practices you need to encourage communication. Communication um, encourages empathy. Empathy encourages understanding, and understanding encourages trust. Um, and trust, um, um, if you don't have it, is it is that drag that inhibits velocity, right? And 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 you know, and this is where we talk about the play between tools and technology as well. Proper automation, support for immutability with traceability. Um, um, would traceability um, facilitates trust as well as taking that path of communication to empathy to understanding to trust. And it's important to realize that this can be really scary for people, right? So as we start having these conversations about breaking down silos and changing models and automating things, folks who have been really successful uh, through their careers can be quite afraid, right? There's this fear of what is my identity going to look at, look like when we make this transformation? And I think it's important to recognize sort of what are some of those symptoms that might be causing that fear and find out what are the things that are driving that and experiment with ways of uh, reducing that so folks can, you know, can really get on board uh, with that transformation. You can, you can sort of win over those skeptics. Well, there's there's also kind of the idea with the tools themselves. I mean, it, it it does go back to people, but you know, to your point, there are going to be learning curves, and there are going to be uh, new ways of doing things that people might not be comfortable with. Um, you know, maybe they're thinking that you know the company is just fixing something that that really isn't broken. Um, and and you know, also people want to use their own tool sets, and and there's there's kind of a you know, a, a, a sense of ownership around what they do and, and how they do it. And um, I, I think that is, is a major, major barrier for a lot of uh, people when, when you start telling them, well, you know, you've been doing it 
this way and 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 it's worked well so far but you know really the way we want to do it is so much better you know it's people are going to have some hard feelings sometimes so um i i think that that's that's also important for companies to to recognize is that you know if, if you give somebody a seat at the table you got to make sure that uh that you know their voice is going to be heard as as loudly as everybody else's yeah, one thing that we see as a big challenge um, through these is scaling these initiatives as well, right? So um, DevOps can uh, frequently be found starting in little pockets within organizations, and you get these small scale successes that uh, tend to expand. It's, it's not dissimilar to the way that Agile was adopted in a lot of companies, you know, a decade ago. Um, and while that's great, you can lead to some problems here with things like tools and technology as you try to scale that across an organization, right? So that's another thing to watch for is while you need those small scale successes to demonstrate the value of a DevOps transformation to the organization, you need to exercise care as you start to scale uh, those initiatives so that the tools don't end up hindering your progress or the technologies that are driving it uh, don't become too uh, unwieldy and difficult to manage at scale, uh, and that complexity becomes a uh, becomes a real concern that can actually break down the success that you had on a small scale early. Yeah, that that was that's that's an important point. You know, are the systems that you have in place um, actually able to accommodate the new tools and the new processes? Um, you know, there's there's nothing worse, I think, than you know having all these these great tools in place to be able to speed development and 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 uh, and speed the process in general, just to be told that well, you know, <laughs> it, it it keeps going offline or or right. it keeps you know popping off because uh, it, we just don't have the the bandwidth to handle it at the moment. Right, or it becomes um, so. it becomes unwieldy. You know, something that worked well at first, you know, maybe you can kind of script these things together and kind of make a, a good piece of automation. But when you get that spread across you know, huge enterprise organizations, uh, the, the fragility of that initial uh, implementation can become evident really fast. So yeah. John, um, Jonathan, you've been, you've been involved in a couple different uh, organizations and implementations. What, what, what have you seen uh, firsthand when it comes to these, these challenges in business transformation? I would love to hear maybe, uh, you know, kind of your from the field uh, thoughts there. Yeah, sure. So there's kind of three things that are pretty consistent. Um, first, we we find that uh, autonomy has been promised to for X amount of time for resources to build things out or learn these concepts. And then you'll have other managers or other directors coming in and pulling them out of, you know, out of, out of our meetings. Um, they're all of a sudden they lose a week of time and now they're playing catch up. So that top-down support and the ability not only to have autonomy, but empowerment is actually different than autonomy. That when we actually do need to make a change or implement something that we don't have to go through the current bureaucracy that might exist in the organization for, for whatever reason. Uh, the second thing that we find is when we start getting into more of the microservices and breaking these applications out, and um, we, we'll find teams wanting to um, own the tool chain right, or own a microservice, which is essentially an anti-pattern. So one of the challenges to the point about scaling is um, how do we create, um, how do we create that organizational structure to support these pipelines and tool chains and microservices without um, creating silo pockets of people that are managing them. Um, and then third, for the third thing that we, that we find is um, an initiative will go well, a pilot's gone well, and then it just doesn't go, it doesn't move anywhere after that. Um, there wasn't a plan to actually scale these into other groups or products, um, what have you. So it's generally the three challenges that we run into pretty consistently. Hmm. Brian or, or Tim, what, what have you guys seen that, that have been, you know, you, you consider to be kind of the major challenges that uh, they're really holding businesses back? Um, Brian, I, so yeah. So some of, you know, I'm going to kind of start with maybe the more um, sort of nebulous, the softer ones, right? I, I'm going to say a major one um, goes back to what we've said before. It's lack of alignment across all stakeholders as to what the goals and objectives are. 
right? Um, but it is also where where I experience. So I, I I often talk about this concept of of something called four quadrants, right? And it basically divides an organization wide transformation into connecting teams and processes from left to right on one to a few teams. And then on the other axis, the amount at which you scale those processes. Um, and what I without fail find is there are organizations that are that are successfully connecting one to a few teams left to right, and they are very high performing, but are consistently struggling to scale um, those practices and recognize those benefits across the organization. Um, this leads to what I would say is oftentimes, well, first I'd say that as a general category, one of the major obstacles is scaling across people, tools, and technology across the organization. And ultimately, if you're seeing the benefits of DevOps on one mobile application, one internal um, website, um, you're really not seeing the economy of scale. Um, so an objective should be um, to, to, to codify um, a DevOps culture across your entire organization. Now, I will say that it is the tools and technology component that gets to be extremely difficult when you are looking to um, scale uh, across an organization. You're now dealing with a heterogeneous set of, of tools and technologies um, and ultimately trying to arrive at some common denominator, right? I'd say trying to tie heterogeneous tools and technologies into a subset of homogeneous practices to achieve a common outcome across your teams. Um, and it is very difficult um, um, to, to cross the communication, culture, as well as real technical boundaries that it takes um, um, to address that heterogeneous world. Okay, Tim, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I think um, uh, those uh, those points from Brian and Jonathan were spot on. Uh, some of the ways we tend to see these manifest are in organizations that have things like regulatory or compliance concerns, right? How do you balance that autonomy with the centralized control that's required to meet your regulatory and compliance issues? Uh, or something like security, where you typically have a highly centralized a uh, bit of expertise in that that's not diffused throughout your whole organization. So if you're breaking down these barriers, how can you make sure that uh, something like security can get woven into the entire process uh, without one small team becoming a bottleneck? All right, great. Well, I'm going to move ahead and because uh, we're starting to uh, run up against a time block here. So um, I'm going to, Tim, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk a little bit about CBA Labs. And then, uh, Brian, I'll let you uh, tell us a little bit more about CloudBees. Uh, yeah, great. So uh, again, pretty quickly here, you know, I'd encourage folks to come in and uh, talk to us, um, visit our website. So CBA Labs is really at the center of many of the topics that we've been discussing here today. Uh, we focus specifically on helping enterprises, um, you know, implement, deliver, scale uh, a DevOps um, transformation uh, through a platform, right? So we uh, have been doing this for as long as the term or longer than DevOps, DevOps has been around. Uh, look into automating deployments, uh, orchestrating releases, uh, and and a new focus that we've had lately is on the insight and metrics behind uh, DevOps transformation. So understanding the impact that you're having uh, by aligning to the business goals that you're hoping your DevOps transformation is going to support. Uh, so all of those things come together uh, through ZBA Labs uh, Enterprise DevOps platform uh, that can uh, really help organizations succeed, particularly when you start to encounter some of those problems we were discussing a moment ago at scale. Excellent. Okay. Brian, why don't you tell us a little more about CloudBees? Well, you know, I'll first segue in off of Tim. Um, you know, CloudBees um, and, and, and Exibia Labs are very similar um, in mission um, and, and strong um, um, counterparts um in sort of achieving that 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 integration of of process and tools across an organization um cloudbees was founded in 2010 as one of the original um, um pass organizations enable people enabling people to do everything from code build to run um, um in the cloud 
Um, we are best known as the Enterprise Jenkins Organization, um, and our CTO is the founder of the Jenkins Project. Um, for those that don't know what Jenkins is, Jenkins is an open source automation engine um, that serves as a continuous delivery server. And um, we have been, um, and it is the most popular, I want to say seven, something to 70% of people in the market have adopted um, Jenkins in some form or fashion. And um, CloudBees um, built the business and has impacted the community on, on helping scale Jenkins and the practices that Jenkins enables within the enterprise so that you're able to achieve um, software at the speed of ideas, i.e. able to go from concept to customer or concept to cash with velocity. Um, we now um, have um, under our wing or working with us um, CodeShip, which is a SaaS platform for quickly implementing continuous delivery um, without the infrastructure overhead or risk. And ultimately with our overall portfolio, we are um, um, looking to help um, organizations achieve DevOps by establishing externally or internally managed CD as a service for their teams. All right, great. Excellent. So let's move on to the Q&A section of today's webinar. I said we'd take about 15 minutes and it is 1.46, so I am nothing if not a woman of my word. So let's go ahead and take a look at... Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and take a look at some of these questions. And we've got uh, just, well, before we get started with the questions, I do want to let folks know that if you do have a question for any of our panelists, uh, about any of today's presentation, um, please just go ahead and use your control panel, uh, get your question in, and uh, we should we should have enough time. We've got a question here from Adnan who asks, can we quantify the benefits of transitioning to DevOps? And what factors do we take into consideration in quantifying the benefits? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Who wants to start? Everybody's, everybody's sniggering. This is a great one. Somebody's got to start. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to be bold enough to start the bidding by saying, Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. we can quantify the benefits of DevOps. A quick stat. So CloudBees issues something that we call the business value assessment or the business value survey. We've talked to, um, uh, we've had roughly three to 400 conversations with 130 customers, have invested you know, multiple hours in each to try to uncover quantifiable benefits at the end of the day, measuring them in either terms of dollars or time for innovation gained. And what we found through our approach, which we will share publicly, I probably won't be able to get into much detail and enable others to answer, is that at a very conservative estimate, by, by, by properly implementing a DevOps culture supported by continuous delivery practices, um, you can achieve a, you know, a minimum of 3,400 uh, um, um, dollars improvement per engineer or development process stakeholder. Scaled across an organization, that turns out to be an, a pretty impressive number. I don't have them in front of me, but I think if we're looking at a 1,500 person shop roughly, um, you know, we're finding that you're gaining um, at least, and I emphasize that this is conservative, um, 1.5 million in improvement. Um, but more importantly, I, you know, I think the, 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 the cost reduction or the dollar gain is not what, what's important. It's that translating to 49 um, man weeks or woman weeks, person weeks, uh, a year that you can gain in an organization of that size. Um, and that is extra time that you can um, 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 put towards innovating and delivering value to your customers. So I'm starting the bid. That was a long, <laughs> that was a long start, guys. But but I'd, I'd like to hear what you guys said. Sure. So Adnan, I'll give you, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, pieces here. So I'm going to give you uh, three or so. Sort of we combine measures and impact, right? I think it's important to think about what are the the sort of out comes as well as the measures uh, that you're going to look at when you're deciding um, the impact here. So a, a couple off, you know, offhand. So deployment frequency is a great measure that can tell you about, you know, how often you deploy code to production. But what that really does is that frees you up to allow the 
deployment of, of code to be based on a business decision, right? You never want to be able to say, hey, we really want to get this value to a customer, but it's not ready. You always want to be able to have that value ready to go and, and high quality. So that's a good example of a, a measure and an outcome. So the measure would be your deployment frequency. The outcome is uh, using business decisions to drive when you release software rather than calendars or other things. Um, things like lead time for uh, the, the time for changes, right? So how long does it take from when you first commit code till that code gets deployed? Uh, that's kind of a measure that you can look at that can uh, talk to outcomes around things like automation and predictability, right? You want to reduce that time from when a developer, you know, sub, uh, makes his code commit to when that gets deployed because uh, that's going to reduce the, the waste in the process. Um, I spoke about mean time to recovery before. That's another great one. So that's a measure that you can look at that can be an indicator of how freely your teams can be, um, you know, kind of experimenting and innovating, uh, right? You know, we don't want to be afraid of failure occasionally, um, but we want to be able to bounce back from it. And, you know, frankly, I would rather have a lot of small experiments from which we can bounce back quickly than kind of like one big epic failure, <laughs> right? It's a lot worse. So, so, so those are the kinds of things I'd encourage is look at both, you know, measures uh, on a kind of global scale and then tie those to outcomes for your business. And that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Anything to add, Jonathan? Yeah, that was great i mean uh almost verbatim what i wanted to say but uh you know and it's absolutely spot on right there has to be measurements and there has to be impact or out outcomes uh one of uh one of the challenges that we do see when we uh, when we advise on some of these metrics is it's hard for it's hard for organizations to see the essentially flow of work and across the cost centers to measure that um one of the ones that is pretty easy is cost of rework right um uh, and then obviously the other ones that he had mentioned, but um, yeah, to, to that point, exactly. Uh, just measurements and outcomes. So. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, the next question, uh, what are your thoughts on having knowledge management as one of the pillars for digital transformation and how would a good knowledge management program look like? Brian, you want to start us for that one or Jonathan, you want to? So, so yeah, so th this ties back to, uh, I had mentioned before about 20 to 25% of the time for experimentation. So, um, what you want is to try to try to um, have some type of way that you're, you're learning through failures and you're learning through things that is highly visible. Um, you know, what, one of the core, co uh, one of the core seven components of lean software development is create knowledge. So, um, you want to have a place that, you know, people can go to that. Um, you can not only see the trending in history, but what lessons have been learned, uh, what type of things are other groups experiencing. Um, so it absolutely should be part of when you hear about tooling or those type of things. Something that um, is created um, and that people have a high high visibility into. Okay. Yeah, and and I'm and you know, I'm, again speaking sort of with a shotgun or a wide with a wide breath, and I'd like to call out you know that that that. Um, we, I welcome questions as they're being asked about detailed practices. I'll continue to speak a little more general and, and say you, you should approach um, the entire SDLC and the entire improvement process as, you know, as, as, as ultimately being about knowledge management, right? At the end of the day, to be able to move at velocity with trust throughout the delivery chain, um, we, we have to, um, um, I, I'd hate to say it sort of, uh, at the, decentralize, in other words, bring in knowledge um, um, from all different parts of the organization, and then centralize and codify that 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 knowledge, so that we then have the repeatable processes that are required for the trust that enable us to work together to deliver at velocity. And so, what I mean by that is, you know, if we look at an everything as code movement, even if we look at binary artifact management. If we look at, a, at value stream mapping, if we look at applying continuous metrics, continuously measuring our development process, what we are doing is we're, 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 we're unchaining 
and consolidating knowledge across the software development life cycle to empower the software development life cycle. So in a very general, ge general way of speaking, a lot of the capabilities that you need to develop to establish a robust continuous delivery pipeline and achieve DevOps are focused on managing a body of knowledge. Um, now, separately, I think when you talk about a knowledge management program, it's probably focused on a more sort of traditional um, 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 enterprise knowledge, man knowledge management program. Um, and I would largely say that those all still apply, right? Um, that, that, that good documentation, maybe not necessarily verbose or ultimately comprehensive documentation is important, but establishing sort of a shared canonical system where we can aggregate um, um, the continuously improving processes and practices and lessons learned is going to be critical. Um, and that's more of that static traditional representation. But it's also important to note that you need to have a way um, to enable ad hoc, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing through um, approaches such as chat ops. Um, and, and so with that, I'll kind of stop to hand it off and save time. But I'd say that knowledge management is core to successfully achieving DevOps. Tim, any quick thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's true. There's some great tools out there. Um, you know, one thing that I would caution folks to make sure of is that, uh, to, to circle this back to the cultural piece, is that uh, you want to address people's fear. You know, the, the accumulated knowledge that an individual has uh, might be something that they they feel is really valuable, right? And it makes them needed and and kind of appreciated uh, in a way that that may be scary if you threaten to to centralize that expertise and that knowledge. So um, think about that too, and you know, make sure that people can continue to feel like uh, they're great experts and that they contribute, um, you know, personally to the success of the organization. All right. Great, great advice all the way around. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, that is about all the time that we have for questions. Um, but I do want to thank everybody who did uh, submit questions. If we didn't get to yours, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I, these guys will get a copy of all the questions, and I'm, I'm hoping that they'll uh, be more than happy to uh, follow up with you off, uh, offline to get your questions answered. Um, I also want to. Uh, thank our panelists today, uh, Tim Buntell, Jonathan Parnell, and Brian Dawson. Thank you all. You guys are awesome. So thanks so much for joining me today. It was, uh, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I hope the audience got as much out of it as I did. Um, I also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, uh, you will be receiving a link to the webinar post event and that will take you to the webinar on demand you're also going to be receiving a link to the ebook that uh, is uh, the uh, uh, what would we call it the companion to this webinar today so uh, take a look out for that as well also if for some reason you don't get a link uh, via email just go to the devops.com website the webinar will be living there just uh, click on the webinar section uh, and we have a whole passel of webinars, both upcoming and on demand that you can choose from. And uh, hopefully there'll be one or two others that uh, pique your interest as well. Uh, and uh, again, thank you gentlemen for joining me today. It was a super fun time. And uh, I would just like to say thank you everybody. Have a great afternoon. This is Charlene O'Hanlon signing off. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.